and um, and then we're going to have the, the co-chair come up and, and, and add in some more things. Um, so okay, so let's start let's start with that. And first, uh, Gail Reynolds, she is one of the uh, chairs of the Sarasota Co uh, County Conservation Committee, and she asked me uh, to please read this letter real quickly uh, to you this evening. Um, in fact, intensifying because of climate change. But the legislature used storm intensity climate change as an excuse to destroy the tree canopy. Our best and cheapest means of defense and, car uh, and carbon sequestration to let deforestation go unimpeded. Uh, it's the exact opposite of what the legislature should have done to protect us from storms. Um, the outrageous bill will make climate change and flooding much worse for us. It paves the way for more of the same, endless road building and urban sprawl. Lobbyists for the chamber, ALEC, and home builders and associated industries are literally writing these bills to make building cheaper, faster, and increase profits. They further endanger the public by passing this bill and others by making Florida an even bigger death trap when the next massive hurricane arrives. Governor DeSantis must veto this bill as well as uh, the toll roads to ruin bill and the destruction of comprehensive planning. Uh, so you're encouraged to please call Governor DeSantis to show his commitment uh, to protecting Florida's environment by vetoing Senate bill 7068 and others okay so um if you all can you know tomorrow's friday last business day of the week um if you all get a chance please give the governor a call and let him know your thoughts on the we, we really need to um, be making sure that we're our our voices are they may it may fall on deaf ears but we still gotta we still have to uh, make our voice heard um so that so that's part of it and then um gail wanted me to announce that a public workshop to discuss citizens initiated uh comp plan amendment and proposed super hamlet at the corner of verna and fruitville at old Mayanka methodist church on old Mayanka road is tuesday at 7 uh, uh 7 p.m opposed orchestra building in Payne Park, City Hall, May 20th at six o'clock, wear yellow. Um, and the, orca the orchestra, orchestra plan would be destroying a natural habitat, privatizing seven acres of parkland now freely accessible to the public, creating a traffic nightmare, not that we don't already have that, but uh, the baseball stadium located at Payne Park in the 1950s created one of the greatest traffic triangles in all of Florida. And um, so basically that's what she's emailed me for her report. And um, and now I will have Mike come up and just really quick, uh, he and Mike can tell you that the upcoming um, Conservation Committee meeting. I'm sure he will, he'll mention that for you all. Good evening, everybody. No, actually, I've, I can't remember the exact date of the conservation meeting. It's the third uh, Tuesday of the month. What, what, what day would that be? Uh, that's going to be this upcoming Tuesday, right? Um, which is, hold on, I'm sorry. Is, is, is this upcoming Tuesday, the third Tuesday? Yeah, I guess it is. It's uh, May, oh, well, the second is May 14th. It's the second Tuesday. So we're the third. So the okay, the 21st. So it's the May, May 21st, it's going to be at Lucky's, and we meet in the community conference room at Lucky's. So everybody's welcome to attend. Just a few quick things about what's going on in the in conservation in the city. Um, in the city, they, it was a four-year fight, but we managed to preserve the bike lanes on Fruitville Road. So the city commission voted on April 15th to keep the bike lanes the way they were and not do anything on Fruitville Road. Uh, a couple of other things from the stop uh, arena. Uh, probably June 3rd, they're going to have a public hearing with the City Commission on public hearings for, they're going to have a public hearing on, to talk about public hearings, 
in, in terms of development. Right now, with a lot of developments, we have what's known as administrative approval, where the develop, where a develop, development is approved just by a series of meetings between the developer and staff. And the public is not invited. There's no, no notice of what they talk about. The staff just meets with the developer, and boom, a few months later, out comes this plan. And there is no planning board involved. There's no city commission involved. It's just all between staff and staff and the developers. So we're trying to change that so the, so the public actually gets involved. Uh, another thing that's going to be coming on after that will be sidewalks and setbacks. Uh, we're working with the city uh, planning department to get wide sidewalks. This is, this is going to enhance the white walkability of the city. And no more of these condominiums that loom over the road. Think of the view of the west end real close to the road. We want to try and get wide sidewalks in the city. And the last thing I want to bend your ear about, um, I don't know how many of you read in the last uh, uh, CR Club, uh, the Boca, but this is something we should all be concerned about. You see these, I, I, I can hand these out, you probably can't see it, but the, the county has planned two major north-south roads east of I-75 and then two major east-west roads. And this is to quote unquote, to support development. So I think all of us should be aware of these roads that the county is, is trying to build in order to essentially Fort Lauderdaleize the east, east of the county, east of I-75. So if anybody wants to see it, get a copy of this map, come to me after the meeting, I'll be happy to, to share it. Larry, did you have a question? No, another question or comment that just happened to Matthew and Jen this afternoon and we discussed it. Um, the issue of the development review, the issue of the stop is raised. May, that, that June 3rd may not be firm. She's kind of indicated it's going to slip. Well, they actually told us May 6th initially, and then they oh. deferred to June 3rd, so, oh. yeah. And so, yeah, maybe it's going to go on. Just, just keep track. Yeah. One, one of the funny things about that whole process is when we first went to the city commission and said, uh, well, we, we'd like you to study, to, to, to make some changes to public hearings, the staff actually told us, they had the nerve to tell us, well, We've only been working with this zoning code for 14, year, uh, 14 years, so it's going to take us six months to think about it before we can come, before we can really analyze the code and come back with any recommendations. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, and okay, so we would normally also get an update uh, on our Manatee Conservation Committee. Um, and Marsha Wickle is the, the chair, and um, I don't see her here this evening, um, and I know she is going to be heading up north. Uh, I don't know if she has already or will be very, very soon. Um, so, but I don't have a report for that. She, she's also the outings chair. Um, so my, uh, what I would say uh, kind of on her behalf is that um, outings will be continuing. And please check your, um, your newsletters that you get in the mail or check the website or the Facebook page about upcoming outings because they are a lot of fun. And so, and I encourage, uh, encourage you all to, if you've not been on an outing, to try one out. And um, okay, so now if I could please have, real quick, have Jerry come up. Are you want her to come up first? Um, Oh, okay. So, all right, real quick, I'll have, we have an announcement about Kona, and so, you're very welcome. Hi, I'm Kathy Benz, and I'm the uh, president of Kona, and we meet in this very room uh, next Monday night, uh, after the weekend. Uh, Charles Hines is going to be there to discuss his priorities as the chair of the county commission, and I encourage you to come uh, and be prepared with questions that you want to ask him. And also, on June 10th, please reserve on your calendar, Kona is going to have Larry Brand, uh, who is the researcher on red tide and blue-green algae, uh, who's discussed very frequently in the uh, newspapers and the magazines. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And now we're going to have our vice chair come up real quick and um, and let let you all know about some positions that we have on our ex, uh, executive committee that still need volunteers. And um, so if any of these sound of interest to you, please let
let Jerry or myself know. And I, I spaced that out. I was hoping I'd have a thing up here, but I don't. <laughs> so, but one of, one of the things, we need help with the refreshment table. Chris has been doing it for quite a while, and we I do need some people to help on that. Um, we usually bring, you know, the cups and the, the supplies. Um, there's also, I, I, I want to take a straw vote. Um, some, when we have our refreshments after, uh, a lot of people are, at the end of the meeting are just ready to cut out. And so we were wondering whether it would be good to have the refreshments at the beginning of the meeting and we socialize and everything and then have the meeting. So um, could I have a show of hands that would like to do it first? Show of hands of wouldn't like it first. You're a lone ranger. <laughs> we, we got three, three more rangers. <laughs> okay. Um, I, <laughs> what? committees we uh, you know we, we need people to turn out for and particularly right now we have gone through Earth Days and we have uh, tables set up at Earth Day and we had uh, one downtown uh, and other events and at Oscar Shear and so we have had a chairman for years who kept picked up the tents and, and all the supplies that we need for Earth Days and everything. And so we haven't had um, a chairman for that part. He has left to tour the country. <laughs> so John Myers was, did this for years. So uh, I, if somebody thinks they would like to be work on the tabling, that would be wonderful help. Um, the board Everybody chips in, but uh, still, we need somebody to head that up. So that's that's the main thing right now. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Um, and also, um, the, you know, there's a couple other positions that, you know, that we can always use help with, like just outreach, like a marketing type of uh, maybe position, um, and. Our, our current treasurer is kind of looking to pass the torch along. So anyone who may be interested in being treasurer for our group, please talk to Bob, um, Bob Feldman. And Bob has double duty because he's also the newsletter editor. So, um, so yeah, so please talk to Jerry or I about any, anything, or if, you, or if you have a new idea for something that we could be doing. That would be great too. Um, we're always, you know, open to hearing new ideas and, and that can make things run better and more efficiently and everything. So, um, okay. So real quick, quick announcement. Um, we do have to pay for this space, so we do ask. Uh, we do pass a little basket around, and so if anybody has a you know a little bit that they could chip in to help offset the costs, that would be ever so appreciated. And so we will be we will pass um, that along. We'll uh, pass some sort of basket or hat or something around. And um, now. The, our first presentation of the evening is um, going to be by Barbara Pavitz, and she is going to give us a presentation about climate change and her experience at the um, conference in Atlanta that um, that uh, former Vice President Al Gore uh, had recently. So please come up and um, and give us your presentation, Barbara. Okay, thank you. My name is Barbara Pevitz, as she said, uh, sort of. <laughs> and I'm a Sierra Club member and of late uh, climate reality leader. 
I attended a conference in Atlanta in March, along with my colleague, Doreen Kahn. Can you hear me okay? Uh, were you hear, hearing me before? Yeah. Okay. So um, we attended that conference. Um, so I just want to put a disclaimer in here. Um, I'm not a trained presenter or a climate change expert, despite, despite the three-day training I attended. So. Moving on from that, um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about the Climate Reality Project. It was founded and chaired by, as uh, Krista said, by former by Vice President Al Gore. Um, <laughs> that's better. Okay. And as of as of the last conference, over 19,000 um, leaders have been trained across 152 countries with leaders as young as 12 and all the way up to age 87. So what uh, interested me in the conference was um, I happened to watch the documentary Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power, and I was overwhelmingly depressed while being totally inspired to do something. So I submitted my application and my resume and after learning only one in three applicants get accepted, I was thrilled. Hey, Barbara, can you talk like, yeah, okay. more directly? Okay. Was I okay so far? Yeah. Did, okay. So, um, at the conference, when I got to the conference, I sat at a, a contingent, at a table with a contingent from Florida, and there was a young man there. He's 11 years old. His name is Levi Draham. And I don't know if you've ever seen him, he's been on 60 Minutes and um, CNN. And he is the youngest plaintiff in a piece of landmark climate legislation, along with 19 others across the country, who are asking the court to mandate that the U.S. lower carbon emissions. So I will reference him in one of my slides in a little bit. And if you have any um, more questions about the conference itself, I'll be happy to answer them after the meeting because we are out of time, a time crunch. So um, part of the, the Climate Reality Project is that Al Gore has uh, consolidated a bunch of presentations. And the one that I'm going to be using is from the Atlanta conference, the Atlanta conference and um, the main focus of that conference was um, environmental injustice. So the original slides, there were 653 original slides. I've gotten, gotten it down to less than 40. So <laughs> from the 40, okay. All right. So. up here with because you can use your phone right to yeah, do the slide okay. okay 
storms and floods are overwhelming coastal communities, rising temperatures and prolonged droughts, threaten rural livelihoods. Heat waves and spreading diseases put urban residents at risk. All too often these impacts strike low-income families and communities of color, hardest of all, inflicting a disproportionate health and economic burden on those least responsible for the, for the crisis. Increasing levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere are causing global average temperatures to rise. 2018 was the 42nd consecutive year with a global temp temperature above the 20th century average. Simply said, the burning of fossil fuels created by human activities for electricity, heat, and transportation cause greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases play an instrument an instrumental role in amplifying solar energy and retaining heat causing global warming. Oceans are absorbing most of the extra heat energy trapped by increased greenhouse gases. As the world gets warmer, the extra heat increases evaporation and, and intensifies the hydrological or water cycle. This increases the likelihood and ferocity of downpours Warmer oceans lead to more intense and rapidly forming hurricanes. Tropical weather systems like hurricanes derive much of their energy from warm ocean waters. The warmer the water, the more potential energy for these weather systems to draw on, and the stronger and more destructive they become. As a result of the planet warming, global mean sea level rise is happening 25% faster than in the late 20th century. Dozens of countries are exposed to the risk of coastal flooding caused by sea level rise. Nearly one third of the world's population, or 2.4 billion people, live one, within 100 kilometers of a coastline. Hurricane Harvey not only caused destruction from wind and water, but these intense weather events have unforeseen hazardous consequences. Hurricane Florence also had collateral damage. In the aftermath of this, of the hurricane's floodwaters, 5,500 pigs and hogs and 3.4 million poultry died across the state of North Carolina. Another example of collateral damage, the majority of landfills that Another example of collateral damage, the majority of landfills that hold coal ash at 250 power plants across the country have leaked dangerous chemicals into, into groundwater. Coal-fired power plants burn more than 800 million tons of coal in the U.S. and generated 110 million tons of coal ash. Few coal ash ponds have waterproof liners to prevent contamination of groundwater and more than half are built below the lo local water table. The extra heat that affects hurricanes also increases evaporation by pulling more water from the soil and causing deeper and longer droughts. The risk of hydrological and agricultural drought increases as temperatures rise. Nearly 40% of the world, 1.3 billion people, rely on agriculture as as its main source of income. So water shortages put the health and well-being not only of animals and crops at risk, but, all, but also of the farmers and communities that depend on them too. This photo shows a drought affected areas of Central America. You can see Honduras and Nicaragua there. The migration of individuals from Central America up to the U.S has been driven at least in part by climate change. In the next decade, climate change will create the world's largest refugee crisis as tens of 
millions of people are forced from their homes. Paradoxically, while extreme weather events like hurricanes, rain events, and flooding are occurring more frequently, research shows that changes in climate have led to hot, dry conditions that increase the risk of fire activity. Wildfires are increasing in size, intensity, and duration, and burning hotter and longer. The area burned by lightning ignited wildfire is projected to increase 30% by 2060 across the southeast. Annually, wildfires can already burn millions of hectares and force hundreds of thousands to evacuate with consequences for both immediate safety and long-term health. Climate change affects the global health system and is the biggest health threat of this century. And it's all in interconnected extreme weather events affecting health, air pollution, heat stress, allergens, etc. Often those most vulnerable are the poor, the elderly, and the children. Climate change affects the air we breathe. Allergies are projected to be much worse in 2040 due to higher pollen counts in the air. This is a photo of a house next to a power plant in an area referred to as Cancer Alley in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Worldwide pollution kills 9 million people per year. More of the reason that African Americans are so adversely affected by air pollution is the proximity to coal plants and other industrial sites. The percentage of African American children suffering from asthma is two times that of white children, and their death rate is 10 times higher. It is an environmental justice issue as vulnerable communities are disproportionately affected by climate change and have less ability to adapt or recover from it. This is, this is another example of this type of exposure in Uniontown, Alabama. And their rightful concerns were dismissed. Climate change is disrupting, is disrupting natural ecosystems in a way that is making life better for infectious diseases. This will occur in the Southeast more than any other region in the US. Economic losses from extreme weather totaled $653 billion over the last two years alone. According to the National Climate Assessment from 2018, the American South and Midwest are expected to suffer the largest economic losses due to climate change. We do have solutions at hand. We don't want to make this all depressing. Renewables like wind and solar can provide the energy we need. Here you can see how the capacity for wind energy has grown exponentially. It has exceeded previous expectations. Globally, wind could supply worldwide electricity consumption 40 times over. Around the world, things are changing. Denmark. Um, this is worthy of repeating, enough solar energy reaches Earth every hour to fill all the world's energy needs for a full year. Coal, oil, and natural gas resources are finite. The sun will continue to shine for at least 5 billion years. Solar energy has also exceeded expectations. Looking forward, U.S. solar PV capacity is expected to more than double over the next five years. By 2023, over 14 gigawatts of solar PV is projected to be installed annually. That was, um, solar panels were somewhat affected by um, President Trump's tariffs, and um, the amount of workers uh, went down actually 3.2% because of that. China continued its global solar dominance in 2018. The newly installed solar PV capacity in China accounted for around 50% of global 
global solar demand. India has set a goal of raising its solar capacity nearly 30 times to 100 gigawatts by 2022. The country reckons its renewable energy industry could generate business opportunities worth $160 billion this decade. Going back to my young friend Levi, Levi told us the question he gets the most is why should we change when, when countries like China or India continue to pollute? I think we need to turn that question around and ask ourselves why we aren't doing more. And some of our states continue to carry out their own objectives. In response to President Trump's decision to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, several states joined together to create the United States Climate Alliance. Washington, New York, and California governors spearheaded the initiative, and 11 other states, as well as Puerto Rico, joined the, joined the bipartisan coalition initially, and seven other states have joined since. The initial member states represent 49% of the U.S. population and the U.S. overall GDP at over $7 trillion combined. The goal of the alliance is to bring states together to reduce emissions 26 to 28% below 2005 levels in compliance with the Paris Agreement. The alliance released a progress report in September 27 detailing their efforts. The original member states collectively reduced net greenhouse gas emissions by 15% and are outperforming other states in economic growth. These are 160 uh, global corporations that have um, made the decision to go 100% renewable. Hang on one second, let me see if I can get this back. climate agreement, but I wanted to say here there are also citywide efforts too. Sierra Club's Ready for 100 campaign has challenged cities in the U.S. to, co to commit to 100% clean energy. When this slide was updated in January 2019, over 100 cities, including Sarasota, had adopted policies committing them to a goal of 100% clean energy, while seven cities had already fulfilled their commitments. Okay. Over 160 global companies have made a commitment to go 100% renewable. Corporations are responsible to their shareholders and their customers. How can we as consumers be better at patronizing corporations or companies that are doing their part? We still hold the power of the purse. And that's my own feeling. It's not anything Al Gore said. And here's the here's the global corporations. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Let us say yes to clean energy and trust that we can and will change. Other countries see the monetary benefits over time of using renewable en energy. We can't afford to do nothing in the face of an, an administration that turns its back on us. If they are closing the doors, we must push on the ones that are, that are open for us. Think of what changes can be affected by corporations who see the cost benefits of going 100% renewable. And that's my own thoughts as well. So, okay. So, that is my slide presentation. Um, and does anybody have any questions?
Go ahead. I have a question. I just wanted to make a question. There's a, a climate strike on May 24th. Is everyone aware of that? At the staff? Yes. 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 Because Actually, it moved it to 11. Huh? And they well, moved the time to 11. It's 11 till 2. Oh. And it's the it's the students, uh, that little Ella, what's your name, that from the book yeah, that they put together. Yeah. But I hope, I mean, I think you're, you should show up. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As I understand it, the student is the global walkout. You know, it's the last day of school, and they're, the students are it started with the, the little gal over in Europe, that uh, Greta, and uh, Ella, I guess, is a Booker student who was like a lone uh, participant the last time they did it. But she has announced that, uh, and I guess we've some of the climate groups have assisted her in getting the uh, permits that are needed to show up. Okay, so the idea is that it is they're they're speaking out. This is our world. You you say you love your kids, you come out here and prove it. And that's, uh, so uh, eleven until two on the twenty fourth, which is the last day of school in Sarasota County. Oh, it's at the Bayfront, right down here at the unconditional surrender statue. That we should make a showing there. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Brooke is up next. And she's got a free school. Is there anything else? first meeting here because I'm from Chicago, but um, I'm on, I was uh, volunteering for the Democratic Party. Oh yes, please, thank you. Hi, I'm Caroline. This is my first Sarasota Sierra Club meeting. I belong to the Sierra Club, but lived in Chicago and have recently relocated here. So I'm happy to meet you all. I volunteered with the Manatee County Democrats oh. for the last election, um, which did not go our way, but um, uh, Vern Buchanan, I'm on the mailing list for Vern Buchanan, and he sends out um, notices if you get on his mailing list, and he has polls. Yes. And some of the polls uh, I strongly disagree with, but the ones that I want to weigh in on, I weigh in on, and I think it's important to, as Sierra Club members to weigh in on the issues and not just kind of lead back, lean back and say, okay, he's a Republican and he's gonna get, uh, there may be Republicans here, but um, that, if you don't agree that you're going to kind of opt out. Um, I will say in Vern Buchanan's, um, I was really happy to see he stands up and he's been uh, supporting the Paris Climate Accord. He believes in staying in the Paris Climate Accord, which I was really proud to hear him say. And he said, let me know how you feel. As my, as my constituent, let me, let, let me know how you feel. So I immediately wrote to him, wrote to his office and said, thank you, I fully support us staying in the Paris Climate Accord. So I would encourage anybody who is interested to get on his mailing list and let your opinions be known and weigh in. And if you are in fact a supporter of the Paris Climate Accord, to let his office know that you support his stance on it. Bill, he has yet to sign on to this. So this that went
going around, we need to pressure him to do that. She's saying the green piece of paper is also a climate bill that you need to let um, Congressman Buchanan know how you feel about it. Um, it's really important he represents us, and honestly, I'm very proud of some of the things he's done on our behalf. So when he does something that we agree with, I think it's in our, all of our best interest to, 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 to congratulate him and tell him that we absolutely support what he's doing. I should also say, I don't know who has access to this. I sent my DVR to my, I think I learned how to do that finally. Coinciding with this meeting tonight, at 7 o'clock tonight, a member of our local CCL Citizens Climate Lobby is on a panel right over here at Channel 7 about Vern Buchanan signing back onto the Paris Agreement and about the bill that the Citizens Climate Lobby put together, the bipartisan bill. We hope that he will go in that direction, but we are seeing good signs. And so Andy is over there now. I hope I'm going to have it on my DVR when I get home. I don't know if they'll repeat it. They did a, a tickler for it at 5 o'clock on the news. So hopefully we're getting some press about these things. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, mentioning that. And, um, and thank you, Barbara, for your presentation. And okay, so I guess we are moving along. Yes? Uh, there was one thing you said. There's some event under unconditional surrender. Yes. Here with dates May uh, May 24th. May 24th. Yes. Right. And I've got a simple. I've been working in the solar industry for 30 years. And the simple answer to your question is: Is the company 10 years old or older? If they were here 10 years ago, they're not an upstart. They understand what they're doing, and they have survived through a bad. So that's an easy one, and Jerry's right. There's a great cooperative here. It's not the only way. I can sell systems at the same cost. Go in there. I've been off the grid. My electric bill is eight dollars a month. I talk to Republicans. I talk to Democrats, and I talk to people all the time. And I go, the electric company takes your money, and especially if you have an income coming in, you're going to lose a thirty percent tax credit. On a system that's twenty thousand dollars, that's six thousand dollars you're going to give to your government, or you're going to give it back. And we now have PACE financing all throughout the state, all throughout that area, that allows somebody to get financing from five years, but more importantly, at twenty and thirty years, put it on your tax bill, and that means you can pay the same or less than what your electric bill is. There are no more barriers to it, and. Talk about job creation. You know, when the guys are up on my roof working on it, and now I'm pulling in the sun's power, there's nothing more empowering than that. So it's a great thing you can do right here, right now. And then when your neighbors see it, that's half the problem. Somebody's got to see one on a neighborhood roof, and then they'll go, Well, how does that work? Okay, thank you. Yes, real quick. Go to his office. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. 
I, we're going to have to move on because it, yes. um, it is getting a little bit later. So, um, but I love to hear, you know, everybody. It, it, it's, it's true. I mean, we all definitely need to make our voices heard to our elected officials. And not just our U.S. congressmen, but also uh, very important our, our um, county commissioners, our charter review board, um, and all, all our local elected officials, the city commissioners. Anyhow, okay, so moving along to our final uh, presentation for the evening. It is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce to you this evening the fantastic Brooke Errett. And Brooke is a organizer um, with Food and Water Watch, uh, based in St. Petersburg. And um, she has been working on passing a statewide fracking ban, working very hard indeed. And, um, and so she's been um, working to get the Florida congresspersons to sign on to the OFF Act to move off fossil fuels and onto renewable energy sources. Uh, prior to working um, at Food and Water Watch, Brooke worked on over 40 political campaigns as a campaign manager, advisor, and field director. Through her political work, she managed uh, volunteer networks of hundreds of individuals and led training workshops and actions statewide. She worked for several nonprofits, including Environment Florida, Florida Consumer Action Network, and PBS as a fundraising cancer. Um, Brooke also managed a field campaign for Next Gen Climate uh, to pass Amendment 1, the Florida Water and Land Conservation Initiative. Uh, she's also an adjunct law professor of advocacy at Fordham University. Um, she earned her BA in political science at the University of Florida prior to getting her Juris Doctorate uh, from Fordham University School of Law. And so please welcome Brooke Eric. So much. So I was motivated by Barbara, so I downloaded an app, so hopefully this will work for the slide presentation. Uh, so as Krista pointed out, I work for Food and Water Watch. Um, we are a national organization. We also have offices overseas. So I thought I'd figure, start by telling you a little bit about what we are. And it worked. Okay, so our history. Um, we go back to 2005, started as a grassroots organization movement, uh, 12 members from Public Citizen, a Nader's um, organization, branched off and started Food and Water Watch. Um, one thing that puts us apart from many other organizations out there is that we are fully funded by individuals. So we take no corporate or government money uh, because we don't want to be beholden to anybody else's interests. Uh, we represent what we feel is best um, and what our members feel is best for us to be working on. Um, since those 12 members started in 2005, we've grown to over 100 employees. Uh, we have offices all over the country. Um, our Florida office is here in St. Petersburg. And we also have offices in Europe, Central, and South America. Some of our notable achievements that we worked on, we were the first organization to step out and say that fracking needed to be banned. Uh, many people thought that was a battle that could never be won. Uh, however, as of this week, we now have four states in the United States that have banned fracking, uh, Vermont, New York, Maryland, and Washington. So hopefully Florida will be next on there. Um, we've also been integral in forming statewide coalitions, bringing other organizations together like Sierra Clubs and um, Environment Florida here in this state, We Think Energy, um, in all of these different states that we've been working on these battles. So we're a big believer that we have to all work together to get things done. Uh, also, we have been fighting really hard. That's where the water comes into our name, stopping corporate takeover of public water supplies, making sure it's accessible to everybody. And uh, we also started the national movement for GMO labeling. Um, that was back in 2007. So our motto is fight like you live here. And that's what we very well intend to do with the support of great individuals like yourselves. Um, we mobilize just regular people. Like I said, we're grassroots. And so what we do is we help 
give people the ability to understand what they can do to make a difference. A lot of people want to get involved, but they don't know how they can do it. They don't know that just five minutes of your time can make a huge difference at times. And so we move bold, uncompromised solutions um, to the most pressing food, water, and climate problems of our time. Um, the big things that we focus on is a climate justice kind of approach where we are protecting people's health, communities, and democracy from the growing destructive power of the most powerful economic interests. So our values are based on, first, having a healthy, livable environment. Uh, we need food and water sources to survive and to do all of the other things that we need to do in life. Um, having human dignity. Uh, right now, it's frontline communities, usually of lower socioeconomic um, areas that are the most impacted, taking away access to clean water, taking away access to healthy foods. We want to stop that from happening. We also believe in justice for all. Uh, we don't focus on one demographic of society. Instead, we focus on society as all people that inhabit this earth. Uh, we also believe in economic fairness. Uh, and so making sure that money is equally distributed and that those who have the most money aren't the ones who are getting all of the resources. And real democracy. Um, as, we, as I pointed out, we fight corporations. And a lot of times we can see that money from corporations is being given a voice. And we are very much against that in the work that we do. So here are three major fights that we are working on. Climate change. We are moving to get the United States completely off of fossil fuel production and onto renewable energy by 2035. Uh, based on the IPCC report that came out last fall, uh, we need to do it now. Um, we have a more aggressive stance than a lot of groups, uh, but we want to make sure that we don't have irreversible damage. Uh, water, as you can tell from our name, uh, and so we've been working to stop corporate pri uh, privatization of water supplies. And then food, having access to food and also making sure that the process of making that food is equitable. Uh, and so we have a very strong fight against factory farming. Right now that's mainly centralized in Virginia, North Carolina, and Iowa. And we hope to grow that through the entire country. So now let's get to what we're all here to talk about today, which is our big fight. So here in Florida, we've been focusing on banning fracking just like uh, we've been able to do in the other states that I mentioned. And uh, so I'm gonna start with just a little explanation of what fracking is. Has anybody here not heard the term fracking before? That is great. Okay, so fracking began as being a term that was short for hydraulic fracturing, which is where large quantities of chemicals, water, and sand around millions of gallons of water per each well that can never be used for human consumption again, are injected at a high um, pressure in order to fracture the earth and release oil and gas. Now here in Florida, we don't really have shale reserves, so any fracking that would be done is to reach inaccessible oil reserves that we have here in the state. Uh, the term fracking, though, has expanded now to be more of a colloquial term for all forms of unconventional drilling. And so what we're going to see is that those are hydraulic fracturing and acid fracturing, which are both the high-pressure type of fracking, and then matrix acidizing, which has really been coming forward in the news this year because of the fight that we've had and what the legislature was doing, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, so the difference is... Matrix acidizing doesn't use the same high fracturing uh, pressure because here in Florida, we are on a karst geology. Basically, we are a calcified sponge, so we're already kind of fracked up. So with matrix acidizing, those same chemicals are just uh, pretty much dumped into the well, and they then dissolve the earth to release the fossil fuel supplies. Now there is something that comes up a lot in this fight as far as what's the difference between acidizing and actual well stimulation. So matrix acidizing is used for um, routine well cleaning, but it's also used for well stimulation. And so with the routine well cleaning, any fracking ban would not get rid of routine cleaning because that would be dangerous. 
we have existing wells, they do need to be cleaned until we can shut them all down. Uh, but what matrix acidizing is often used to do, along with acid and hydraulic fracturing, is to not just clean the well, but instead to actually stimulate the well and to pull out the oil and gas. Any questions about fracking so far? Okay, great. So, uh, a lot of people, when I'm out there talking and when we're out there having fights about this, having rallies, having just general information to the public, are like, well, there's no fracking in Florida. How could fracking ever happen in this state? Well, guess what? It has. Um, this is what really opened up the fracking fight here in Florida on New Year's Eve 2013 into 2014. Community of Naples realized, and this is kind of dark, but Naples is right there in the very background, the core of the city. Did not know that Dan Hughes Corporation was fracking literally in their backyards. And this was discovered they did not have a permit to frack or to drill in the state. Uh, right now, fracking is 100% legal. If you have a permit to drill, then you have a permit to frack. And so this did luckily get shut down since they didn't have an existing permit. However, we found out, especially over this last legislative session, that fracking has occurred in Florida a lot more than we realized. Um, <laughs> in the committee hearings, the oil and gas industry came out and said, oh yeah, it's real safe, we've been doing it all the time, more or less. Aaron, well, that's not really a great argument, but thank you for that information. So this is a looming threat for the state of Florida. So you can't frack everywhere in Florida because we don't have oil everywhere in Florida. So the main places that fracking occurs down in this area, and this is also oil drilling as well, um, which, does anybody know what's down in this area of the state? Yeah, it doesn't sound like a great place to be doing drilling. And then also up here in the Panhandle, in the Big Bend area, and further west towards Alabama. So when we hear about fracking, that is where it would be occurring. When we hear about drilling, that's where it would be occurring. However, we are on top of one of the largest pure aquifers in the country. It's the Florida aquifer, which goes from about here all the way up through the entire state into Georgia. So if you contaminate water here, you're contaminating water here. So that's why fracking anywhere in Florida is basically fracking everywhere in Florida. 93% uh, of Floridians depend on that aquifer for their drinking water. Once that water has been used to frack, um, known human carcinogens like benzene have been introduced into the water. It cannot be pulled out. That water can never go back into the aquifer and it can never be used for human consumption again. So we're talking millions upon millions of gallons of fresh water that can never be used. Uh, so we're looking at a looming crisis uh, as this keeps moving forward. So what are some of the effects of fracking? So we talked about how, you know, first of all, it's not really that pretty sitting right outside of your city having a big old fracking rig. Uh, but there's a lot of really serious effects as well. And it really, this is why it's become a nonpartisan issue, is because no matter if you consider yourself a tree hugger or if you're someone who's just worried about the economy, it impacts everything. So um, first of all, health. Um, they have found that women who live near fracking operations have a 40% chance more likelihood of having a premature baby. Babies that are born premature, if you want to go learn more about this, go to the March of Dimes website, but they have a litany of health problems that they are susceptible to for the rest of their lives. Um, also, uh, if we're going to the money argument, uh, Duke University found that fracking decreases nearby home values. Um, on average, in Pennsylvania, home values went down to th about $30,000 per home, simply because fracking was happening nearby, and people don't want the noise pollution, the traffic, the trucks coming in and out, and so people don't want to live there. And then the really big problem is the spills. 
So these spills can be surface spills, they can be underground spills. Uh, they have to get rid of that wastewater. It can't go back into the aquifer. And so a lot of the problems happen when they're trying to get rid of it. So they are needing to take those millions of gallons of contaminated water, ship it out, so trucks end up spilling it. Uh, you end up having issues when they're trying to pump it. Usually what they do, they inject it into the ground, and we'll get more into that in a sec. But uh, there's just so many problems that can happen with that wastewater, which is toxic. And also the oil and gas industry hasn't even let us know what all the chemicals are that are in fracking. So uh, they say it's proprietary knowledge. Uh, so we don't even know exactly how bad those chemicals could be. If it wasn't something bad, then they probably wouldn't be trying to hide it so much from us. But we do know that, like I mentioned, benzene is a common one. Uh, we already talked about the water usage, about one to eight million gallons of water per each frack. Um, issues with disposing the flow back. So when that water goes down, the fracking fluid, and it comes back up, it can spill at the drill site. Um, also, they're needing to clear land. Uh, they have to get rid of the wastewater. Um, traffic, because they have so many truck trips per well, uh, we already have traffic problems. We have that horrible toll road uh, bill that just passed. We already are having such trouble. Can you imagine 4,000 truck trips per each well? and how quickly that can ingest and wear down our infrastructure. So it's a problem that affects pretty much every aspect of our life. And now, uh, something you may have heard about, when you get rid of this wastewater and you inject it into the ground, it can cause seismic activity, which uh, Florida is not known for seismic activity. However, in just the last week of March and the first week of April this year, the Panhandle experienced nine earthquakes from the disposal of wastewater that was happening on the Florida-Alabama border. Um, in Oklahoma, since they started having their fracking boom there, it's gone up 400 um, per 400% the amount of earthquakes that they're having. So it opens up other environmental damages, shifting our plates, it can impact then storm behavior, and just a lot of different things. We don't need to be messing up the ground underneath our feet. And then we just found out, uh, so the Department of Environmental Protection, who oversees oil and drilling, oil drilling here in Florida, uh, is not really great at sharing their information uh, they may have very, I know, shocker, exactly. Uh, so we recently had our team of researchers do a very in-depth um, analysis and information gathering from the, from the DEP here. Um, found out that, first of all, um, there are only 57 active wells currently in Florida. However, when you have more um, unconventional, like when those wells start going dry or when those they can't get the oil anymore, they generally will turn to unconventional drilling. So uh, there's over 80, I think there's 87 open permits right now. So we could look at 30 possible sites that could have unconventional drilling beginning soon. Things like fracking, matrix acidizing. But with those 57 active wells, between 2015 and 2018, we had 35 oil-related spills here in this state. Has anyone in here heard anything about any of those spills? Was it in the news? No. So the problem, and they are also self-reporting. So they depend on the oil and gas companies to report those. So we're averaging nine oil-related spills a year currently with just 57 active wells. So it, it's very terrifying to think about what could happen. Um, with unconventional drilling, the occurrence of spills increases. So those 35 oil-related spills, one was in an elementary school that contaminated the soil outside of the playground. Um, there was another one that contributed to polluting a creek where all of the local um, people used for recreation. Um, but that was just regular oil drilling. So when we start doing unconventional drilling like fracking, 
those occurrences increase greatly for example in north dakota where fracking has just boomed it is one of the largest fracking states in the nation there have been 4,400 spills in the last 10 years and over a thousand oil related spills in 2011 alone so it's a, a very real threat and we can't currently depend on the oil and gas industry to be honest with us when they have these spills and DEP has a very little regulation authority over them. So what did we do when we found out about all this bad stuff? We took to the streets, we took to the legislature, we took to newspapers, we do things all, we've been organizing all around this state, um, meeting with local, or excuse me, state legislators, um, setting up fracking rigs in areas that people wouldn't want to see them, having a um, annual lobby day at the Capitol, um, working with the indigenous communities in the Everglades. This past year, uh, you guys are in a real great place. Uh, you've got Senate President Galvano here, who uh, we were trying to work with to make sure that the legislation moved forward. So I know a lot of the faces in here were very active in these different events that we were doing to call on him to support the bill. And we've also had a lot of coverage from local papers and around the entire state uh, with all of the work that we've been doing. So, um, so that's where the state of fracking is. That's what we've been doing. Any questions on any of that so far? Okay, so now we're gonna do a little, oh yes, yes sir. Those were the ones that were reported. Were reported by whom? By the oil and gas industry. Like ones that pretty much they were really bad, so it was kind of hard not to have them reported. I mean, when you're in the backyard of an elementary school or you spill it into a creek, um, but like probably on site. I mean, I don't I don't want to make up a number of how many they probably actually were, but there were 35 self-reported incidents or reported by you know impacted individuals so you know it's very possible the school said hey we had this spill but um, yeah so we don't know we know that it's 35 plus yep. anything else yes yeah, sir I think that the Physicians for Social Responsibility would give the most accurate answer to that, and they do have a compendium on fracking. He asked about the premature births. My understanding is that something about the air pollution, it lets off a lot of methane, something about the vibrations and the noise pollution, and just the general aggregate effects of all of that ends up causing the more the higher likelihood of premature births but i would and if you want to take my information i can look it up and get you a more scientific answer to it but yeah um but it, i mean it's it was very consistent in pennsylvania where they do a lot of fracking that that was the case yes sir yeah just a comment about the everglades it's just, it's just so sad the everglades can't win i mean they were basically destroyed, and then we spent a lot of taxpayer money, I think it was at one point the largest restoration project in history. Mm -hmm. And now it's got another, another threat that's totally separate that uh, could, could affect it again. It, we spent all this taxpayer money to quote the story. Yeah. yeah. Most definitely. So he was asking about like the Everglades restoration, and now we have this other threat. And the threat is actually even more more real than um, you know just conjecture, because we do have Cantor Corporation with an active permit, even though it's tied up in legal battles, and the governor has said that he will fight that from coming to fruition. But Cantor does want to use unconventional oil drilling in the Everglades, uh, which is like it's terrifying. Um, and so that's why 
we've realized that this is a threat that's now, it's urgent, and it can impact us all. And so we need to do whatever we can to make sure that we nip this in the bud before it's too late. Because we also have um, a Bert, what's called the Burt Harris Act, and this is in the slides, I'm diverging a bit. But the Burt Harris Act here in Florida, that if you are using a piece of property for a pre-existing use, it is very difficult for them to stop you from doing it. So right now, because fracking isn't openly reported, um, even though they're saying that they are using it, um, it's a lot easier to ban it prior to it becoming prevalent in our state, because then you're not having the takings issue under the Burt Harris Act. Sorry if I confused, like made this a lot more in the weeds with that, but that's why it's urgent now. Yes. Uh, she asked how they're deciding where they're going to drill. Well, there's, um, like I said, showed you earlier, the, like down in southwest Florida and in the Panhandle are where the reserves are. So the first thing is they go to where the oil is. And then secondly, they are deciding based on how the well is performing. And then if they feel that there is an oil reserve still there and conventional drilling isn't pulling it up, then that's when they turn to unconventional drilling means. So right now, all of that's in the hands of the oil and gas industry, and it is very minimally regulated besides just you have to have a permit, and you're supposed to report when you do bad stuff. And so uh, they're able to do 100% any type of procedure that they want as long as it's not been outlawed. So the laws are already there, and they're only using the ones that are already Yes, currently, um, I mean, Florida doesn't have a really big gas supply in general, I mean, oil supply in general, and so they're using the pre-existing permits now. That's why they're doing exploratory drilling in some areas, though. That's what Cantor wants to do in the Everglades in western Broward County. So the exploratory drilling means that they're going in, they're doing the seismic testing, they're digging, they're seeing if they can find anything, and if it is productive and they feel like there's something there, then they set up a well if they get the permit. Okay. Yes, sir. absolutely correct with that is talking about land use and how the permitting is so the permit that exists is not just hey I got a permit to do whatever I want with this land but they do have to actively get a drilling permit so if there's a drilling permit that becomes an acceptable land use on that piece of property okay so I'm gonna I know we're getting near the end here so all of that stuff I was showing you where we're out waving signs we're meeting with legislators it is not just to do a bunch of tactics and then just hope that somebody sweeps in and does something about it. There's one thing we've learned. No elected official is going to do something out of the goodness of their heart. Well, I want to say no. There's some good people out there for sure. But it's because they're being held accountable. And so that is what we've been doing with all these actions is being very strategic to target the right people to make sure that legislation moves through. The way that we've been working is going through the Florida legislature because we just came off of eight years of an administration that there was no chance at all of doing anything from the governor's seat. Um, so that's what I'm going to go through real quickly. The history of fracking bans in Florida. 2013 and 2014. This was right after that Dan Hughes well. So um, we were able to defeat chemical disclosure bills that the oil and gas industry were supporting uh, for their proprietary chemicals and trying to find a way to regulate it so that they could still actively do it. Anytime you hear regulations with fracking, it means that they're just trying to find a loophole to work their way in there to make fracking legal across the board. Then 2015 and 2016, um, there were the regulation bills. So that's one step up from the chemical disclosure. They were trying to say, oh, we'll make it super safe. We'll give DEP this list of things that they're going to do, and then fracking will be great, and nobody has to worry about it. Defeated those. Down. 2017 and 
2017 is when things really started picking up steam. In 2017, we were able to get bipartisan fracking ban bills in the House and Senate. This was for the first time. Yes, it's very exciting because anyone who's familiar with the makeup of our legislature, it is a supermajority Republican. So that means that you need to have the support of Republicans, and it had been Democrats that were putting these bills out before. So as long as we're able to get people from both parties to work together, we have a chance of success. Also that year, um, there was a utility fee for speculative fracking bill. Um, so I think it was Florida Power and Light was at the very end of session trying to sneak in this bill saying that they were going to charge um, us, the ratepayers, for their speculative fracking in Oklahoma to try to bring down the rates, but instead actually charge us. Um, Duke Energy did this a couple years prior. We were able to knock that down though. So stopping fracking out of the state too. Then last year was when we really um, started picking up. Not only did we have bipartisan ban bills that were in the House and Senate, but they also moved through committee. So real quick lesson about the way the legislature works. Bill is filed. It does not go straight to the floor uh, to be voted on. Usually it's assigned to anywhere between two and four committees. Um, less committees you're assigned to means that the people in charge are wanting to push that. Uh, so we were assigned to three committees in both the House and the Senate. Um, House was a really bad place under Corcoran to move. Um, under Negron in the Senate, who was the Senate president, we were able to get it through two committees. Our third committee hearing when they were gonna make that decision was February 14th of 2018. Does anybody remember what happened that day? Parkland. Exactly. The entire, we were halfway through session, and um, the entire legislature, and rightfully so, um, turned to addressing the um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre, and so our bill was knocked to the side. Florida only has 60 days to pass laws. If you get knocked to the side at any point, then you're probably not gonna be able to get it through. So that is everything coming up to the 2018 gubernatorial race, where we knew Scott was getting out, but we didn't know who was getting in. And so that's where we made it our point to get every single major gubernatorial candidate on the record stating that they would support a fracking ban. So we had, all of the Democratic candidates was pretty easy, just walked up and asked them. <laughs> and um, then, Living hopefully this place. The big one, our guy uh, DeSantis, who ended up winning, uh, July 3rd last year, went to the Sean Hannity DeSantis rally in Tampa, thousands of people. I was with this great woman who's one of our volunteers, Ginger Goper. Uh, she streamlined to the governor and was gonna get him on the record, so let's see if it plays. the state and the next day the headline read all of the gubernatorial candidates have now agreed on fracking <laughs> but yet did, we didn't stop there we had to hold pressure on him the entire way through the election and then once he was elected up until the day of his inauguration because he had made part of his campaign promise because of that one little interaction to ban fracking on day one. So, 2019 has become the year to ban fracking. So, he was inaugurated on January 8th. January 10th 
and we had actions all over the Capitol. Wherever he went during that inauguration tour, there were people there with these giant to-do lists, um, like post-it notes that said, ban fracking, to-do list, ban fracking. Uh, two days later, he issued the environmental executive order, last line on it, called on DEP to oppose fracking. But that's just talk, so we had to keep moving. And then bipartisan free, he didn't, it, it, it seems like he didn't know what he was saying in that video, but we held him accountable. <laughs> and so um, bipartisan fracking ban bills were both again introduced in the House and Senate. On January 30th, um, House Speaker Jose Oliva and Senate President Bill Galvano were both questioned about fracking at that press conference for the state of the legislature, and they both said that they would bring them forward to be voted on this session. However, in February, they changed the definition of fracking and introduced their own bills, threw out the bipartisan bills, and excluded that type of fracking that I was telling you about called matrix acidizing, where they dump the chemicals in the ground to absorb the earth. So we were between a rock and a hard place. We want an all-out ban. Our coalition wants an all-out ban. We want to make sure that we get it matrix acidizing band because that bill would not stand on its own because people don't really know what it is, but fracking would have allowed it to move through. So we're opposing the bill while supporting the bill, which allowed the legislature to weasel their way out of getting a fracking ban passed. Um, as of the last week of session, both Senate President Galvano and um, Speaker Oliva had said that they would hear it on the floor, pull it out of committee, if they got a signal from the other side. Well, they were just using the blame game, neither got a signal from the other side. And so, session ended, no statewide fracking ban. But all hope is not lost, because what can we do now? We have a governor who's already shown that he will act when we put him under pressure. And so he can use his executive power, this is how New York banned fracking, through executive power to initiate the rulemaking process in the Department of Environmental Protection where they will ban fracking from all oil drilling permits. So legislative session's over, but we have a governor that we can push now to move forward on this. And so that's what we're doing. So what can you do? You can take out your phones and take a picture of this and call this number and say those words. And then when you do that, text five friends and have them do the same thing. And this is his evening number, so when you call that number, I mean, you can call it right when you leave here because it's just gonna go to voicemail, you just push zero, and he'll walk in tomorrow morning and have messages from everybody saying that we want him to use his executive power to ban fracking. Everybody get that info? Okay. Yes. I am wondering, listening to you talk, as to how much influence the industry is having over our lawmakers we see a tremendous amount of advertising just to the general public telling us that the great wonders of natural gas and tar sands, and the average non-professional in those fields doesn't even know what that stuff means. And can you speak to the connection between natural gas and tar sands and all these things we're being said, because this is a good thing, we're gonna be energy independent and we're gonna have all this good stuff. You know, how can I, speak to somebody who is supporting it because the industry is telling him this is a good thing. I, I'd say my number one way that I would talk to somebody who's like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's cheaper, it's cleaner. The cleanest, just because something's a little cheaper, a little cleaner, doesn't make it the best option. Um, you know, like, oh, I never shower, now I'm gonna shower once a month. Well, you know what, you could shower every day. So let's make it go to what we need to do. Right now, solar energy is 12 times more affordable than any other form of energy. So if it's a money issue, transferring to solar, and we have, as you, she mentioned over there, the companies that can help to bring this to fruition. 
Also, if we do not get off of fossil fuels, including natural gas, which doesn't have the carbon footprint, but it has a methane footprint. And methane you, uh, causes more drastic immediate impacts to our, um, to our climate than carbon does. It doesn't hang around as long, but the impacts are stronger. We see some powerful lobbying going on. And I have yes. connections in West Virginia and Western Maryland where my own relatives work for the coal industry. And they're going to tell you that windmills are destroying birds, and you know, guess what? You, you guys are all wrong. You know, I mean, I'm hearing all of that stuff. And you know, they got this good, clean coal, and you know. As long as corporations are able to use money without any boundaries, we're going to be having to fight that. Um, I was just sent out to California to work on a ban in San Luis Obispo County. It was an amendment. 150,000 residents in that county, the oil and gas industry dumped $12 million into that campaign. So I mean, when you think about that, they're able to spread a lot of false information. Um, our, what we do is that we're going to be the people who bring out the information, who get it in the news, who are able to put the pressure, because even though these companies are able to spread false information, if these people don't get reelected because bad information is continually coming out about them in the papers, writing letters to the editor, um, having big events that are calling them out, um, we do see that this creates change. It is an uphill battle, and it never stops. But, um, you know, that's just how we got to do it. And look who's running the show. I mean, I just want to say that, that your operative word has to be renewable. Renewable. We're talking about this. It's not just a bad thing. Yeah, we don't move to renewable energy and get off of fossil fuels by 2035. Uh, the impacts to our climate are going to be to the point where we're going to have major climate migration. People are afraid of immigration right now and the issues that um, we're surrounding that. If people can't grow food or have water to drink, they're gonna go to where they can. The um, Department of Defense has actually come out and said the biggest threat to our nation's security is not energy independence or dependence, but instead whether or not we are going to have water for our citizens to drink, and that there will be massive world wars regarding water. Yes, dear. This is nothing new. Through history, popu huge populations have moved across the world. Because of climate change, drought, uh, wars, the wars have been caused by those climate change, etc. It is going, if we don't do something, it is going to cause major changes, whether we, and we have no idea what they'll be. Amen to that. It's so true. Yes? Rick Atkins, uh, is your slide uh, presentation online on your website? It is not online or on our website, but if you, I'm going to put my information up here in a second. You actually already have my I, I, I'm live streaming it. So she's it. live streaming it. You can so get it on there. And I can I'll provide tag you individually friend. with some information, oh, too. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, so everybody's got this now. We're at the end. Wait. Oh, I thought I had one other slide in there. Okay. Well, the other thing I was going to say is that you are able to, um, other ways to get involved is you can... Um, and I don't have the form with me. It was don't text or that you could sign up at our website, sign the petition that's going around, and then we can keep you in the loop of what's going on. And then you can also always reach out to me, um, either phone number, uh, office, or mobile, and uh, I can tell you how we can all work together and the little things or big things that you can do to help out with everything we're doing. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thanks for having me here. Okay, thank you, Brooke. And um, there's going to be a lot of messages tomorrow for our governor, is there not? Yes. I already shared on our Facebook page, and I shared on my own page, and I shared on the Environmental Caucus page. So that's what we need to do. Spread the word, ask others to please Call the governor. Um, it's a fantastic idea. We need to get this uh, get this happening. Uh, it, 
So thank you so much, Brooke, for your presentation. And your comments. Um, and so I think we are about ready to wrap up. Um, and I really appreciate everyone uh, attending this evening. And please feel free to enjoy some treats over over at our table over here. And um, I'm sure Brooke and Barbara um, are going to hang around just a little bit. So if you have any uh, question that you'd like to ask them. And again, thank you so much. And I will uh, hopefully see you all the next meeting. And just so you know, our next meeting in June, which will be the second uh, Thursday as always, right here in this location, same time, um, will be um, our last meeting uh, before we take a, a couple month uh, hiatus. So we will not have meetings in July or August. So please attend our June meeting and thanks so much. <laughs>